All right. So welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday again. This is the Wednesday weekly learning session with local bartending school. My name is Carlos Navia. I've been a professional bartender for many, many years in a handful of states and even in Mexico for a while. I now live here in San Luis Obispo, California. I have been training bartenders for local bartending school for about eight years now. I started doing it in Florida before I came back to California, and I've continued to do it since. Um, I've not seen anyone live since COVID started. It has been a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of seeing people online. So I do do this every Wednesday uh, at, this real quick, do this, do this every Wednesday to uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific time, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And you also might recognize me from some of the online videos in the local bartending school course. So I have some fun things to talk about today, as always, but I always like to start by asking if anybody has any questions about anything that they would like to ask that I can answer for them. Okay, so if nobody has any questions, we'll just kind of move into today's topic. We're going to talk, uh, going to talk about a couple of different things. Um, you know, I showed, I think a week ago, some pictures I had taken uh, at the football game, went to the Rams game, first real game with fans, you know, in the new stadium in Los Angeles. Uh, it was very cool how everything was digital. You know, your phone was your parking pass, your phone was your ticket. They accepted no cash there. Everything was done digitally with cards or with Apple Pay. So it was really kind of cool to see how the technology is progressing and that they had no paper involved in the entire stadium. But one thing I forgot to mention was, what were they serving beer in? And I've brought these up before when I've talked about just, um, you know, kind of recycling and um, sustainability, which is kind of a big word now and a big hot button topic, especially where I live in California. These are ball aluminum cups. So solo cups do not get recycled. Solo cups go into landfills. And by putting, you know, these beers in recyclable aluminum cups, like you see here made by this company, you know, they probably cut down I don't know, 100,000, if not more, solo cups or, you know, plastic uh, non-reusable cups didn't go into landfills just in that single game alone by using these. Uh, I'm going to put this one other, one other picture up too, because I think it's important, you know, we just got to remember what's proper to recycle and what we can and can't recycle. You know, just because you throw anything into that recycling bin does not mean it gets recycled. You know, paper, um, paper bags, old mail, stuff like that, bo boxes, cartons, uh, no food containers. Once it's got food in it, it's not recyclable. We've got to throw it away, as well as wet paper, stuff like paper towels, coffee cups, solo cups, you know, any types of food containers, straws, plasticware like forks, stuff like that, you know, juice pouches, stuff like that. None of that is recyclable. Um, I think it's funny because when they show actually in this picture on the right hand side where they're showing what is recyclable, uh, all those containers are supposed to be empty and they show a bunch of containers with liquid in it. No, make sure the containers are empty before you put them in the recycling glass, you know, plastic bottles, stuff like that, aluminum cans, stuff like that can definitely go into there. But, you know, make sure we're recycling the right things when we're throwing them in the recycling bin. And, you know, start checking out the ball plastic, uh, the ball aluminum cups, I should say. They really do cut down on the waste, you know, and what we're putting into landfills, you know, with plastic cups, non-reusable cups that we use. Um, other thing I want to talk about is it's Tales of the Cocktail Time, and I know I kind of bring it up every week. Uh, it's been a lot of fun poking out around in there and going to some temp seminars and some lessons and some different discussions that they had. I will admit that I have not had as much time to dedicate to watching things on Tales of the Cocktail as I hoped I would. Had a lot of classes and a lot of things this week, but I've got into some of them. Um, you know, some of them are very cool. Uh, I think they're all, well, they're all going to be recorded. So, you know, there's always an opportunity for you to go back and watch some of these if some of these things interest you. You know, there's also still some things going on tonight when we get done here, as well as all day tomorrow. And they give out the Spirit Awards then, which are, you know, awards for like best drink of the year. Um, it's kind of funny. They even start, you know, it's it's about mind, body, and, you know, heart that we put all into it. So they actually start with morning yoga that you can get up and do with other bartenders in the morning. One of the ones I wish I could have seen, and I hope I could uh, uh, watch a video of it, was talking about safe bars and just dealing with different difficult patrons and de-escalating skills for the pandemic and beyond. You know, we're kind of in a weird situation here where people have been cooped up for a very long time. 
and coming out into a public scene and into a social scene, people are acting different than they were two years ago, you know, in the same setting. So we really got to kind of be careful when we're dealing with people and, you know, old approach might not work. You know, we're looking at a new thing. We're looking at something that none of us have dealt with in our lifetimes. So we can't just always take the same approach. We have to kind of evolve and work towards, you know, proper ways to deescalate things and bring bad situations down, make everybody happy. There's tons of very cool demonstrations. Um, Adam Fournier, who won for the United States Best World Class Bartender 2021 for the U.S., uh, did some really good ones um, that I thought were awesome and I think it was very cool. You know, um, what was I trying to say? Um, ah, what did he do? Uh, French 75, a, a hibiscus French 75, which I thought was very, very cool. And we might try that a little bit here when we get to the end of it. But you can check out that. And those are all videotaped. Those are all pre-recorded. So they're kind of fun. You want some demonstrations. You get some cool ideas for drinks. Um, you know, one of the topics that I've talked about before is um, non-alcoholic drinks or, or no, non-alcoholic spirits. It, it's a real thing. And it's here to stay. You know, it's it's something that's come up, you know, because people started drinking earlier in the day, staying home, but it is a definite trend. And I don't think it's going away. It seems to be, you know, kind of growing. So, you know, this is liars. This is a whole line of non-alcoholic spirits that they sell from gin to vermouth to amaretto to whiskey to vodka to just about anything else you can think of. So this is a trend that's happening. You know, it is something that I don't think is going away that's really gaining popularity right now. So don't be surprised if you start hearing people talking about or you see, th see things about non-alcoholic spirits. This is exactly what they're talking about that we're looking at right here. I don't mean to blow that up like that necessarily. Um, oh, they talked a lot about wine. Wine Matters is one of their shows that they're doing every day, which is just a little wine kind of round circle. Uh, the, the, the knowledge of wine goes on and on and on, much, much beyond me. Um, you know, when they really get into the deep, deep uh, dive of how to describe the different flavors in wine, it is, it is very evolved and it is uh, very elaborate. So, you know, you can always check that out. If you're a wino, I shouldn't say it like that. If you're a wine enthusiast, uh, you know, you can always check that out and, 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 you know, see what the other wine enthusiasts have to say about stuff like that. Um, it, you know, some of the things they do too is because Tales of the Cocktail is really just about the advancement of, you know, the hospitality industry is they're really trying to help people on all levels of the hospitality industry from the owners, you know, to the managers, to the bartenders, to the frontline employees. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really very cool that they, that they have that set up and it really is a community that reaches out and helps each other. Uh, you know, they had tons of seminars for owners about profitability. How do I really know how much a drink cost me? You know, setting up food menus, making menus, programming POS systems and everything like that. It is really great information. You know, if you have aspirations of owning a restaurant, own a restaurant or your own bar one day, you know, to have some of this information and get it directly from people that have already walked that path. You know, the information is out there people have already done it and been successful at it. And they're more than willing to share that information with you and, you know, help you in any way in, in your endeavors and trying to put together your own project or your own bar or something like that. So I think that's very cool. One of the very cool things they do, you know, for, for the managers and the people that are running the establishments, they have a lot of help too on how to deal with employees, how to deal with different situations, setting up schedules and dealing with problems that come up as well as, you know, menu development and stuff like that, that a lot of, uh, you know, managers are responsible for in different departments. So I think they do offer a lot of great information, you know, for, for basically every level and not just the bartenders themselves. Um, you know, as for the bartenders, it was really all about us, isn't it? Um, you know, so for them, besides just, you know, discussing, different cocktails and different ideas and different trends that are happening right now in the industry. You know, they also go as far as what was the one I saw earlier today, um, how bartenders can thrive as entrepreneurs within the spirit industry. You know, it, it is more than just helping you be a better bartender and work for someone else. It's about, you You know, they have a lot of things about building your own brand and creating your own brand. And that's what a lot of people are doing now and especially with the aid of the internet and social media and stuff like that which I am not great at and I need to get better at and work on my Facebook page that I put together and haven't done much with um, you know it, it is a big thing right now 
<clears throat> and we've seen a lot of people that, you know, go from being bartenders and being in the spirit industry to then being brand ambassadors. And if you have a large social media following, you have a lot of people, then you have a lot of reach. And that has value to distributors and to producers of alcohol. If you can reach a lot of people and be an ambassador for them and put out their content and get it into people's hands and into people's homes, they're willing to pay for that and they will. So it's kind of a new age as far as things like that go. But it's a very cool thing that they are willing to help people on all levels. Sorry. And I think it is really the kind of industry where that's that's pretty normal, where we try to help each other and we try to build people up, you know, bring people up with us. So you can always check that out. <clears throat> Tons of things with the actual spirit makers who make the different alcoholic beverages that we use every day, you know, from the Nolets family that makes Kettle One and Nolets to the Don Julio family, which is the first real high-end tequila. That's what Don Julio set out to make in 1942 when he came out with his original one now. You know, so there, there's tons of great information there, um, you know, about the process, how they make the stuff and how they really come to put different things together to create the flavor they want to create that certain spirit. Uh, what I love about it, too, is I think you really, really see the passion in the faces of the distillers and the people that make these beverages. Um, and, and I love this business. I'm passionate about this business, but you can really see their passion for what they do. And, you know, it's not just making a hooch to them. It's an art form. And it really is. So it's, it's great to watch them and see them live and see how great they are and how passionate they are about their products. All right, it's getting a little scratchy there. Um, you know, I did get, go through um, a seminar yesterday. I had the fortune of sitting through most of it. I came in a little late. Um, it was talking about unconscious bias. And it is, it is a very, very crazy thing because, you know, our brain makes unconscious decisions without us realizing it. Uh, this gentleman gave a great lecture talking about how kind of it affects the workplace in certain situations. Um, you know, um, you know, inclusive, inclu ah, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, diversity and inclusiveness is what I was trying to say are real big things right now, especially in the industry. You know, it's it's really about having a diverse staff, you know, about letting people be open and letting people be comfortable with who they are at work. I live in California where there are very, very crazy sexual harassment laws concerning how you can refer to them someone and how people identify with gender and how they can dress and do anything. But, you know, it, what anyone wants to do, they're free to do. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I really don't care as long as you show up to work and do your job. And I kind of think that that's one of the biggest things and one of the biggest points there. Why should someone be treated differently if they can do the same job? But he brought up a lot of a lot of studies that I was familiar with. Um, most of them, uh, you know, they study everything. They can set up experiments for everything. And w one of the ones he mentioned, and I've seen this done two different ways, is you know they can take the exact same resume, put a man's name at the top, send it to a hundred employers put a woman's name at the top, send it to another 100 employers. And when it comes back, 75% of the employers will say, the one with the man's name, that he was a capable hire, they would hire him. The one with the woman's name, when it comes back, only about 50% say that that's a capable employee and that they would hire him. When the only thing that's changed on the resume is the name at the top. So it is very weird and we do do it subconsciously. You know, the other thing it kind of relates to that's been a, a real hot button word now, microaggressions. Um, you know, and I, I guess difference may be, may being in the way he explained it, you know, sometimes microaggressions are not unconscious, are not coming from your subconscious. They're actually a conscious action. Whereas, you know, unconscious bias, we really don't know, really don't think about it sometimes, but it is true. You tend to identify with people that are more like yourself and give them the benefit of the doubt. And it's something that everyone does. It's just who we are. It's just part of human nature. But the biggest thing is being conscious of it. You know, when you're aware there's a problem, when you're aware, you know, you start to become aware of something, it doesn't mean it stops. It means my brain still goes there some days, but then I can catch it. Oh, you know what? I think I'm making this decision in a, in a biased fashion. So, you know, it's just something to be aware of. And um, I think you can find the tape of that one on there as well. I thought it was a very, very, uh, you know, very kind of eye-opening lecture. Um, this one I thought was interesting too, it's cocktail spirits and ADHD. And I was very surprised because the first thing they did was put a poll up 
of how many of you know the attendees to the conference were either diagnosed or thought that they probably had ADHD. And it was an extremely large percentage of the people that were joining the conference. So I don't know if there's necessarily something that relates to you know, having a, an attention deficit disorder and loving being in the middle of nonstop action where it's constantly moving and there's, you know, never a lack of stuff going on, but they're looking into it. And I thought that that was a very cool concept that someone had come up with and begun researching and started to kind of look into. Um, you know, they talk about cocktail trends and I think I kind of delved into them a little bit. Um, you know, a, a week or two ago, just talking about kind of what the biggest trends were and, you know, what kind of the top selling drinks in the world were that, that you know, are going, going really well right now. Um, so I'm not going to go through all those, but it, but it is nice to kind of keep up with some of these, you know, the world's best bartenders and some of the top people in the spirits industry and see what kind of new concepts and new things they're coming up with. Um, you know, one of the newest ones, and Don Julio was doing a presentation about it either earlier today or yesterday. Um, you know, they talk about underground, underground cocktails, underground cocktails. And, you know, they're referring to the use of roots and stuff like that, which is kind of a new trend as far as things go and using them in cocktails. So roots and stuff that grows under the ground have become kind of a new thing. And, you know, it, it kind of opens a whole new world to different flavors and different things that we can kind of use to balance with the flavors that we already use in the bar. So if you've got any great ideas, if there's any type of thing that grows under the ground that you want to put into a cocktail and have some fun with and experiment with, uh, feel free to jump right in there. Um, that's what, you know, a lot of the world's best bartenders are doing right now and coming up with different ideas. Um, you know, one of the other things that, that I've noticed that they talked about, and, and it is a new trend and is coming back is a highball which is just, you know, whiskey and ginger ale really in its essence. Uh, you know, Jim Beam even has a new commercial out or pretty recent commercial out where, you know, the guy can't decide what to drink. And he looks at one person and he's like, drink this oatmeal stout something. And someone else mentions another weird beer. And finally the bartender's like, how about a Jim Beam highball? He's like, that sounds good. You know, so it is making a comeback and what they've kind of put out there and it's a little contest and I think it's just fun. The contest is kind of over. They put it out to the 50 world's best bartenders earlier this year, but, um, you know, find something local that you can put into a highball and kind of put a local spin with something that grows locally in the area you live in into a highball. And I think it's an awesome idea. I think everybody should try for it. I live in tons of farmland. So I am kind of going through what's grown out here besides grapes to make wine, because that's what's mostly grown out here. But I'm trying to see if I can come up with something myself to put a little spin on a highball, give it a little local slow feeling uh, for San Luis Obispo, California here. And, you know, once again, I encourage you to find something that grows in your area, something that's native to your area that you could put into it and put your own spin on it and make your own, you know, local highball. Um, and, and the other thing, and this has been a topic for a couple of years now, mental health. Um, you know, kind of, it, it is really kind of just it, it, a lot of times, you know, a live fast industry where we work long hours and then we go out and we party long hours a lot of times. And, you know, I, I kind of brought it up with someone was, was mentioning, you know, earlier this week, you know, saying, hey, I worked 15 hours last week or showing up to work like, oh, I've only slept three hours, you know, that, that shouldn't be applauded. It shouldn't be a badge of honor. That's not good for your mental health. It's not good for your overall general health. So you do have a lot of topics about that. Yoga in the morning, a great way to start and kind of loosen the brain as well as the body up. Um, you know, so we do talk a lot about that. I think this is an industry that definitely burns people out. And it happens, and I've seen it happen to a lot of people. And not just get burned out to where they don't want to go on anymore, but they get burned out in a certain restaurant or a certain situation. After three, four, five years of the same thing over and over again, it can become tedious, it can become monotonous. And that person starts performing poorly just because they're barred out. That person leaves, goes to another restaurant, starts over, and bam, you know, they're back to the person that they were when they started the first place doing a great job. So it is important to, you know, practice good mental health and have things away from just bars. <laughs> you know, I love working in bars and then going to bars and then going back to work in bars myself, but you should have some kind of outside activity to be a more well-rounded person. You know, 
on most applications, there's a section that, that refers to hobbies or interest or, you know, something that you do. Always try to put something in there. You know, they want to know you're a well-rounded person. They want to know that you have outside interest. It will make you a better employee. It will make you a more productive employee. Less chance of you getting burned out and one day just cracking and not being able to deal with it anymore. So that's a big topic as well. <clears throat> um, the last conference I was just uh, actually watching right here before I started to set up. For this today, you know, it was talking about the evolution and the return to bars. And I was very curious to see what, what it was going to be about and what they were talking about. And what they ended up talking about is a topic I posted in the forum and got some great responses to. And what I've been hearing from numerous people, you know, in places all over that bars are short staffed and they need bartenders now. Um, you know, I have a student in British Columbia. He walked into a bar and got a job with no experience and decided, hey, maybe I should go to bar school and learn about this. Um, I ended up doing a class for a student in Nevada last night on a just kind of at the last second because she went and applied for a job earlier that day. And they told her show up tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So she started her first day at 11 o'clock this morning behind the bar. So they really are looking for people out there. It really is a shortage of bartenders. Um, we don't know if the end in you know federal unemployment payment is going to create you know a surge back to the workforce. My opinion, I really believe that that those people aren't coming back. That that the pandemic has created so many work at home jobs now that if they can just stay at home and make money, why bother going out to the bar? And you know what, if that's their attitude about it, fine. They weren't passionate about it anyway. They're not the kind of people we wanna work with anyway. Much rather have people that wanna learn and wanna work and are passionate about what they do. Um, you know, and all these positions that have moved from office jobs to at home jobs during the pandemic, they're not going back to the offices, folks. There is no reason to bring them back, okay? We've proven that they can do their job from home. It is better for the employer. It is better for the employee. They're never going back to the offices. They're never going back to sitting in cubicles. So there's a great, great opportunity, you know, better than there's been in a very long time for people that are entering this industry and new people. You know, they have four people on the panel of this last lecture that I was just listening to, and every single one of them said the same exact thing. Uh, they all own restaurants, they all own bars, you know, in major cities around the world. And they all said the same thing. I am willing to work with that person. I have no problem with it. If you're going to show up on time and you're ready to work, I can work with that. And I understand that I'm working with someone that doesn't have a ton of experience. It's beside the point. I just need you to be here and be willing to work. And they basically all said the same thing in that. We understand that we are going to be hiring people that do not have that much experience, if any experience at all. And it's the same thing I've been saying for quite a long time. I'd much rather have someone that shows up on time and busts their butt every day than someone with a lot of experience that shows up five minutes late and does the least amount of work possible. That person does nothing for me. Um, you know, as a manager, what ends up happening is if the work doesn't get done, you end up doing it or get in trouble for not being a proper manager. So the opportunities are out there. There are tons of opportunities. People are getting jobs right now with little to no experience in the bar. So it really is just about getting out there, getting your resume out there, getting your face out there, talking to people, letting them know who you are, letting them know, hey, I don't have a lot of experience. I might make some mistakes, but I can do this. I will be here. I will bust my butt for you. Uh, the last kind of topic I'll talk about that they have is the Spirit Awards. So, you know, they do have their annual awards every year and different types of competitions and categories that they do. So they've been going through, you know, some of them and doing some of the competitions throughout this week. Um, I believe when we get done here with this, there still are a couple more things today, as well as um, some cocktail parties and happy hours. So it, it is kind of cool that they do have uh, certain live social times where you can sit and basically enjoy a cocktail and talk about cocktails and mixers. Um, one of the sponsors for this is Q Mixers, which is a brand of cocktail mixers that are out there. Um, Diageo is another one who, if you don't know Diageo, they sell No Let's, Kettle One, Ron Zacapa, Johnny Walker, are all the brands uh, that Diageo owns. Um, 
you know, so it's very cool. They sit down and they kind of chat for an hour and they have a cocktail or two and you're kind of encouraged to join them and have a cocktail or two and you can ask questions of them and kind of, you know, pick their brains if you want to. So it's fun. Um, I've also seen a lot of actual in-person meetups. And I know some of the stuff that's going on tonight is going to be actually coming from the French Quarter in New Orleans, which is where they usually hold the conference in person. Um, you know, try to look for, for the bright side of things and the silver lining. COVID, you know, took this whole thing digital so it could be enjoyed by everybody around the world. Um, I've been wanting to go to see it in the French Quarter for a long time in New Orleans. I have been to the French Quarter many, many times. Um, I will say this, it is a very fun place. You can have a very good time there, but be careful. It is also kind of a dangerous town. And if you're on Bourbon Street and all the bars, you're fine. But if you go one block off Bourbon Street, there's no street lights, there's alleys and darkness and it's a neighborhood and you're, you're not in the safest area. So do kind of beware there. You know, if you go around there, I had the benefit of meeting someone that lived there and never having to see it as a tourist. I only hung out with locals. So it was a lot of fun. I spent New Year's Eve 2000 there. I've been to Mardi Gras. It's a really great time. I can't wait until the full Tales of the Cocktail is back in person so I can make my plans to go hopefully next year. And we'll go check that out and I will come live to you from Tales of the Cocktail if I can, if I can make that happen and get that going. Um, you know, so they're having some of the parties there live and they're going through some of the wards and they're doing some of the other things tonight, which, which should be a real, real good time. And, you know, still a full slate of stuff tomorrow, still, you know, all kinds of stuff that you can be part of that's streaming live, um, you know, that's interactive where you can ask questions and they're on to the questions live for you and, you know, interact and deal with some of the speakers and some of the, you know, most prominent people in the spirit industry in the world. And, you know, as we're kind of talking about New Orleans and uh, Nolens is how you're supposed to say it, Nolens, Louisiana, as I was told, um, from the folks that live down there, very nice Cajun folks that live down there. Um, you know, they're going through something that seems like it happens every five to 10 years to those poor folks down in New Orleans. Um, they have had another hurricane come through, you know, Hurricane Ida and ravaged their city. And it is, <laughs> it's unfortunate you know, their city is basically, if you dig six feet down in New Orleans, you hit water. So that's why everybody's buried above ground in like mausoleums, um, which make the graveyards kind of fun to go through and look at. There's some cool, very famous graves you check out if you ever go there, but it doesn't do well when hurricanes come. It doesn't stop a hurricane very well. So unfortunately their city has been kind of ravaged again. Um, you know, I know Perrier was doing some benefits uh, during Tales of the Cocktail. I'm not sure if they got anything still going as far as that, but they were actually doing some live benefits in some major cities in LA and Chicago and uh, uh, New York City where they just set up a day at a certain bar and you came in and whatever was spent in the bar was just going to be sent down for relief funds, um, you know, for the hurricane victims in New Orleans. So it, it is, you know, I still got family that lives in lower Alabama right there on the Gulf Coast. I had the great fortune of in the, I think, seven summers I lived there, not having to deal with any storm that was too large. They seemed to kind of all move away and never really hit us very hard. So, you know, I grew up in the desert. Desert boy didn't have to go through a hurricane, thank God. Uh, I would have been way out of my element. Um, but, you know, I know those people have been hit hard. So, you know, there's there's real good, you know, relief efforts out there if you've got something extra. Or, you know, you see kind of some kind of benefit where you can go to a bar, have a couple of cocktails, and know that it's going to support the people and the relief efforts in that town. It is a, a really, really good cause down there. But, you know, that kind of brings me into the actual cocktail, the hurricane. So let's talk about hurricanes and real hurricanes just a little bit here. Um, you know, hurricane came about, I think probably in the 40s or 50s as I was doing a little research in there today. Uh, you know, it came just because an abundance of rum, I think in the late 40s. So after World War II, couldn't get a lot of whiskey. They couldn't get a lot of scotch. So they ended up with a lot of rum though, because rum was readily available. It could easily be run from the islands, uh, you know, up to the Gulf Coast, to Louisiana and Florida and Lower Alabama and Mississippi and places like that. They were also getting it brought down the Mississippi River from up north. So they ended up with an abundance of rum. So Pat O'Brien of the famous Pat O'Brien's, oh wait, I got a question. I can answer that too before I get too far into hurricanes. I didn't see it pop up. Favorite drink to make and how do you make it? 
All right, let, let me <laughs> let's talk about hurricanes, and then maybe 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 we'll kind of get to that. I don't know necessarily that I have a favorite. Let me think about that for a second, uh, but I will answer it. I think favorite drink to make some margarita, but let's let's talk about hurricanes first, and I'll actually spin back. I'll give you some tips on margaritas as well. Um, so Pat O'Brien, with an abundance of rum, decided to make to find the recipe. I believe the recipe was already out there and came up with the hurricane and that is a hurricane glass which i don't have i'm going to do mine in a tulip glass that is pat o'brien's in the french quarter in new orleans so because of the abundance of rum they decided to go ahead and make this drink and i'm going to bring out my tulip glass and i will show you how to make it right here at the bar today now i am not really going to use real alcohol here i am just going to use colored water that i have set up here in my little test bar and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a lime here. I'm going to cut my lime in half. I'm going to take the little nubs off the end so it just doesn't have those little butts off the end. And I'll kind of explain why in a minute. And I'm going to cut this guy in half. Throw that over here. So I'm going to start off with my glass here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stir this one. So I'm just going to do it in a clear. Actually, I'm not going to use that one. I'm just going to do it in a clear pint glass like this. in there. So I want to start off with some rum. So we're going to do one ounce of dark rum. That looks like dark rum. And we'll do an ounce of light rum. Then we want to go ahead and do an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice. And as a general rule of thumb, a whole lime or a whole lemon is one ounce. I know some are a little bigger than others, a little fatter than others. I have done a practical field test and it is amazingly accurate. It is very, very close. So I'm gonna do a whole lime here. Now I took the nub off the lime there for a specific reason. Sometimes when that nub is sticking up and this round part comes down, it will catch the nub, it will fold this piece of fruit in half. You really don't get a good squeeze. You really don't get all the juice out of the fruit. So I've got the flat part, this is gonna come down sort of, if I line it up right, it's gonna come down sort of on that flat part. It should give me a nice good squeeze right down through the middle, boom. Like that, then out of here, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the other half in there as well. Nice good squeeze like that. All right, so I'm gonna grab my simple syrup here. Get the bottle open. I'm gonna do just half an ounce of simple syrup. In there like that. I'm gonna do half an ounce of grenadine here. And then what am I missing? Okay. I'm gonna do half an ounce of this passion fruit passion fruit. If I can get the words out and if I can get it out. Passion fruit puree, if I can say it correctly. I'm gonna have to rinse that out. And then we're gonna do a little orange juice. So I'm gonna do about three ounces of orange juice in here like this. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So take my handy dandy bar spoon. I'm gonna give it a nice, nice mix here. Knock some ice out of the top. Just a nice mix here and get it kind of mixed up. Get everything nicely in there and all those flavors together. And we'll see the passion fruit kind of move in there and move down it. Just like that. Come back with some fresh ice into my fancy tulip glass here into my specialty cocktail glass. I'm going to take my handy dandy strainer here in there and I'm going to go ahead and double strain this because I want to get some of these it's got a little bit of chunks of the passion fruit in there and I want to get those out so I'm going to give it a nice double strain here into my specialty glass bam just like that down off to the side then I need a nice garnish to go with that so let's grab an orange I am going to go ahead and make myself a nice little full moon here out of this orange. Like that. Shoot off the side. But I'm going to give it a little, uh, 
little nice look here with an umbrella. So if you're ever working with these, keys to the umbrellas is they got two rubber bands on them. One holds, as I drop it, one holds this tight on there. You want to take it off, but you want to make sure you're not sliding the smaller one off the stick. There's a little small one on the stick here that you need to push up to make the umbrella stay open like that nicely. So I'm going to grab my umbrella and I'm going to make what they call a flag. So if I can get a cherry, come on, big guy. So if I take my pick and I go through a cherry like that, then I go into a piece of orange or a piece of pineapple. What I have is a nice flag and it's not as I want to stand up for me, bless its heart. Put my straw in there, give him my cocktail napkin. And we have our beautiful hurricane there, ready to go just like at Pat O'Brien's. So that is the traditional hurricane right there. Great, great drink, really strong drink, rum, fruit juice, sweetness, delicious, fantastic, nice looking with my flag on top. Now you asked me what my favorite drink is to make and I love margaritas and I've always loved margaritas and I love tequila and I grew up in Southern California. So I grew up going to Mexico right down the way when I was a little kid all the time. So that is still one of my favorite drinks to make, um, you know, even though it's popular and it's made all kinds of different places and all kinds of different ways. Biggest thing, making a margarita, give it a little shake if you've got the time. It really goes a long way when it, when it comes to making margaritas. You know, most drinks, it doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot. It's not going to go too far, but it gives it just a touch of frothiness on the top and really, really makes a big difference. It only takes two seconds, one, two, pour it back in there, and it's really just that easy. You know, and even if I'm doing a margarita with salt on it, you know, someone comes up and they order two margaritas on the rocks and I grab two glasses, you know, with salt and I grab two glasses without salt and put my ice in. I start building my margarita. Um, you know, inevitably one of them's going to go, hey, we want salt on that. And I give it a little shake. Let it drip out. And there I can go to my salt ring, put it in the sponge, put it in the salt, pour it back in and it gets a nice little mix and it gets a nice little shake. Um, usually about the time I go to throw it in there, the second person grabs the first person and goes, shut up, just leave him alone, he knows what he's doing. Because they're just not used to getting that little bit of extra effort, just that little shake that you put in there. Um, so, you know, in all honesty, that's my favorite one to make. Uh, you know, if people are ordering top shelf margaritas or, you know, Cadillac margaritas, as they say, maybe you top it off with a little Grand Meunier. But if you really, really want a good margarita and, you know, I'll, I am not going to do it next week, but maybe I'll have to, because I already know what next week's is. Um, maybe I'll have to do a real good margarita demonstration uh, here, maybe the week after that, because, you know, it, it's a great drink. You, you can have some fun with it. You can put some flavors in it. You can do some different things with it. You know, put jalapenos in it. You, people use agave in it and different things like that as well to sweeten it up. Um, but I love just a real traditional margarita, the way it was made at Husong Cantina in Ensenada, just tequila, orange liqueur, lime juice. On the rocks with salt, oh, beautiful. You can't beat it, just a perfect balance of the tequila, you know, a good mezcal too with a little smokiness. If you're into that, if you're into that flavor, it is good as well, but that, that's probably one of my favorites if I had to answer that question. So I hope that answers your question okay. Um, you know, we still got some time. <laughs> Tim Ford from Escal. Yeah. And there's some really good ones coming out too. You know, like uh, Brian Cranston, who's in Breaking Bad, has has one that came out with another friend of his called Dos Hombres, which I really want to go try because um, tequilas and mezcals, you know, celebrities buying tequila or owning tequilas and mezcals is a bit huge, huge trend right now. So uh, uh, that's a real, real big thing. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try one more. Um, well, you're looking out for that. Yeah, Dos Hombres. I haven't seen it in the store yet here either. So I have to keep checking, but I hear the commercials in Los Angeles. This is Los Angeles radio. So I hear the commercials all the time. Um, God, I'm not going back to LA this year. If for some reason I have to go to back to LA this year, I will definitely try to find it. And if I do bring the bottle on, maybe give it a live taste test or something. Um, so, you know, I saw uh, Anna Fournier do this earlier. So I thought, you know, Go ahead and give it a go, and we can kind of have a little fun with this. Uh, talking about his hibiscus French 75. So, first, I want to start with just we're going to do. I don't know if this guy's going to fit in there. That guy's not going to fit in there. So, I'm just going to go ahead and squeeze some fresh lemon juice out from the other half of this lemon that I got. 
into my mixing tin. And you know what? I was taught to do the French 75 originally, just doing it in the champagne flute and mixing everything up in there. But I kind of like the idea of doing it in the mixing tin and then pouring it back in there. So I've got that squeezed in there. I'm going to grab some ice like this. And then I'm going to put half an ounce of simple syrup. in here you know you could also use raw sugar sugar cube a spoonful of sugar um you know a packet of sugar all about the same i'm gonna do about a half ounce of this hibiscus syrup that i have there to make the hibiscus french 75 like he was making i'm gonna come back to my other side and see if that side's clean enough and we're gonna do an ounce and a half of gin come on buddy Two, three, four, five, six. Over like here. I'll pop my tin in there. Give it a nice shake. Get that all nice and mixed up. I'll pop it off there nice and easy like that. Come back with my strainer that I hope doesn't have mango in it still. Okay, cool. I'm gonna get my champagne flute. Now pour up my mix up concoction in there. So I've got my gin, I've got my sugar, I've got my lemon juice, I've got everything in there. It's mixed up nicely. Uh, we come back and top it off with champagne and I don't really wanna waste real champagne. So I'm just gonna use some club soda to give it a little bit of a bubble. Come back, finish it off with a nice little lemon twist like this. Once again, when we do our lemon twist, we wanna get the essence of the outside of the peel in there. So I'm gonna go all the way around the rim with that. I'll give it a nice twist over the top, boom, drop it in there just like that. And that is our hibiscus. French 75, they're ready to go. So does anybody else have any questions about anything, uh, any topic <laughs> about anything talked about today or anything else that I can answer questions about for you? I'm gonna rinse my hands off. Okay, well then I'm gonna thank everybody once I get some water for showing up today and being part of the Wednesday weekly, Wednesday weekly learning session. Uh, next week, it is officially fall. It, the scenes have changed. The air has changed here where I live. So we are going into the next season. So next week, I really wanna talk about fall cocktails. You know, if there's a topic or two I run across in the next day and tales of the cocktail, I might bring that up as well. But we'll start talking about fall cocktails and kind of harvest cocktails and transitioning into, you know, the new season and how things will change and, and uh, with the seasons in the uh, cocktail industry and in the spirit industry. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and I will see you all next week. Thank you.